welcome to Radio Free Will, a podcast from for sovereign people. I'm your host, George McCullough, and we're coming at you live and direct from Grigstown, New Jersey. You know, if you've been following this podcast, um, we had Michelle Mockers on, and he's been talking about the positive dialectic, his philosophy for replacing capitalism, socialism, and communism. And I invite everybody to go back and listen to older podcasts um, so you can um, get yourself caught up. But today, Michelle, you want to talk about... uh, Yeah, I wanted to worry about a subject that uh, every time I have the occasion to talk about, I talk about it. Because we were eventually a very, very small army, but we try at, during the World War II, at the end of the War II, we try the French resistance, try to help as much as possible with the means that we had. We try to help beat the German and stop the German and do very noisy for the German. And we did succeed in many occasions. So okay. I would, of course, like to say that uh, the French free Three French people, I mean, uh, lost uh, in, the, in the country, tried to help the Allies as much as they could. Um, well, let's go back for a second before World War II. You said France had a small army. Um, they didn't build up armaments after World War I? Or? No, no, don't forget that at the beginning of World War II, the French had more tanks than the Germans, Mm -hmm. and more planes, British and French are more planes than the Germans, and we did nothing with that, absolutely nothing. And and what happened to to this army? Because the Germans just rolled into France and took it over practically overnight, right? Yeah, almost, but for one very specific reason, the the, the French were still, I believe, that the, the, the French were still at World War I, And they never believed, they never believed that the Germans could go through the forest of Ardennes. You know, the the frontier, the French frontier was partly uh, defended by the Ligne Maginot, which was a very, very strong, strong line, uh, beton, you know, guns. It it was, nobody could take it if you want. And on the other side, we were used with World War I, that the German was passed by the other side. We never imagined that the German would go through the forest of Ardennes. And they surprised the French. They were in France with nobody stopping them. And how old were you before the start of World War II? How long? How old were you? How old I was? Yeah. I am born in 1922. I am born after the, the war, which is the which was supposed to be the last of all the wars, World War I. So you were about 17 years old? Yeah, I was in, in 19... in, in 60... in uh, 50... in what? 49. 49? In 49, at the mm-hmm. liberation in 49, I was only, what, 22, 22 years old. Wow. Something like that. So you spent your teen life in World War II. Oh, absolutely. I was in college when the Germans invaded France and my father didn't want me to stay in La Baule where I was at that period of time. He said, you should fly away because the Germans, we don't know what they are going to do with people your age. And in fact, I spent three years of my life just escaping the Germans because I was supposed to be one of the volunteers to work in German factories. It was an obligation, a legal obligation to go. And I didn't go, and I, I had a, a, what you call that, mandat d'arrêt against me by the Germans, on my name by the Germans, to arrest me, because I didn't go to Germany, and I spent three years of my life trying to escape the German by all possible means, up to the time where I went, finally went, uh, in the middle of France, to my grandmother, who had rented a house not to be in Paris, and that was where I started 
to, to, to create a group of resistance. So um, uh, what it? kind of factory did they, did they want you to work in? Oh yes, all the all the German factory, you know, of armaments and all the all that type of factories, all German factories, and they were telling you if you, for one volunteer, we liberate one soldier, one prisoner. That was the you know that was the that was the the reward for going to Germany. But wow. I didn't want to go and work in Germany. The, the reward one guy, hey, there were uh, one million over there. That makes no difference. It was making a difference not to help the Germans to build armaments. So, did the Germans have your name? Were you like on a list of for course, people to look at? Of course, of course, oh, absolutely. You were on, absolutely. They are all the names. They were the Germans were very, very well organized, my dear. Very, very well organized. And when we had at the point, I had a fake uh, card of identity, you know, to be able to travel. Uh -huh to reach precisely. I was in the south of France. I was close to Marseille, and I wanted to join my, my grandmother in the middle of France. I had to travel, and I had to add uh, an identity. And when you had a fake card of your identity, the big thing was to take the identity of an existing personage, which was a little younger than you, mm -hmm. but the German could verify that the personage existed. So I was, I was the double of uh, René Bello, a man named René Bello. And I was René Bello for the rest of the war. Oh, uh, that's why the book is called René's War. <laughs> yeah, René's War, that's why it's René's War. And besides that, what is strange is that René is my second name. But René Bello was an existing boy, my, uh, two years younger than me. Did you know this person? No, absolutely not. The people who were making the fake, they were not, nobody was giving any information. You know, the big thing when you are invaded is to know as less as possible and to give as less as possible information because you always have the ears ready to hear what you don't want them to hear precisely. And the, the main thing, you know, I was at, at became part of the British mission, I, will, I can explain why, but the big, the rule was to know as less as possible, because if you are taken by the German and, you know, torture or whatever it is, you could not talk of what you didn't know. You could not give right, names. Right. You could, so that was the, the, the rule number one. Don't know or know as less as possible. So... Do you, it, it, it's possible that the Rennie might, the real Rennie might be alive today. <laughs> yes, you know. <laughs> you know. So what did happen is that uh, I, I run one, one, one way, another one, way, uh, working for 15 days here or there, you know, uh, for three years, my dear, for, for three years I, I was absolutely nowhere. And finally, when I went to my grandmother, I... <laughs> I found a job in a, in a farm, and my grandmother was exactly at the limit, you know, there was a French, free French, and occupied France. And there was some kind of a frontier, and I was just next to that frontier. You know, the Germans were all the way to the, to the coast, up to, to Spain, and the free French was inside of that. And my grandmother had rented the house, that was very good for what we did after that, precisely in the middle of France, and under the, the line of demarcation and on the road that was going to Vierzon, the uh, a railroad station. France has two big railroads, north-south, east-west. And uh, on the east-west, there was Vierzon, and that was the only station where the German, retreating German, after the invasion of Normandy, could, could they put their tank on, on trains and go to Germany. So all the Germans passed by where we were. And it's why we have been able to work a little to stop them. So how many people did you help recruit for the French resistance? Well, you know, well, okay, let me tell you a little more. The French, the, the, I started to mentally running for three years. I said, no, I must fight fight them, you know, 
and it was the beginning, the beginning of uh, the, the D-Day was, you know, on. Mm -hmm. So I say we must try our best to, to bother the German and I must try to, to figure out how to do it. And I created, I had a group, I created a group of about 12, 12 men. And on the 6th of June, the D-Day, we became some kind of an official maquis, uh, you know, resistance group. And my group of 12 men, where I was, I, I, I located it somewhere, all of a sudden, in one week, we were almost in less than one week, about one week, we were almost 100 people. There was another group of men, there were 600, and they, they went up to 1,200. All the people who were camouflaged in the country, you know, were joining to fight the Germans. That's very nice, but there is a fantastic problem, my dear, the problem you don't think about. It's nice to have eventually fight the Germans, but you have to eat to fight the Germans. And my number one problem was not to say if the guy could fight if we had the armaments, whatever it was, but was to feed all those people of one day to the next. You have nobody, and all of a sudden you have almost 100 people to feed. So that was a fantastic problem for me. That, that took a lot of time to solve. Um, were you guys armed? Did, did uh, you have rifles and... No, uh, no, 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 no. It was very, in the beginning, when I created that, that group, we didn't have armaments for everybody. Plus, those armaments were armaments that were sent from England and were, uh, I should say, in the, in, the, in the fat, the grease of the manufacturer. You know, they were absolutely not ready to, to, to fight. Plus, they were very light armaments. La, la mitraillette stem which is, a, you can see it ev absolutely everywhere, and it was really a piece of junk, let me tell you that, because everybody in England was manufacturing it. Every, everyone who could manufacture something like that was doing it. So you had, I believe it was 32 bullets, you know, in the, in the post bullets. But if you put the 32, the thing did, didn't work. The first one didn't go in. <laughs> so if you didn't know that, you were pulling in the whole thing, and it's how you see that the people, the two guys who attacked the, the big commander officer in, uh, what was in Poland, uh, you know, and attack their jump, their, their car at a, at a curve. The one has a grenade and send the grenade and the other one has stem and the stem didn't work. Absolutely didn't work. <laughs> because the stem didn't work. You had to know exactly how to, to, to use the stem. Plus the stem, it was very nice to have stem. They sent it because it was a very cheap, cheap armament. But if you wanted to, 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 keep, to, to kill somebody with that, you have to know exactly how to do it. Because if you just shoot at that person, you can be sure that you will never kill it. It will go boop, it will go on the, <laughs> on the right. <laughs> you say boom, and it goes on the right. You have to start to kill somebody to start absolutely on the left and low, because it will go up. So you kill nobody with that. It's, it's, it, was, it was nice to have that. You to feel, you know, confident. Uh, more serious was carbines and things like that. And we even inherited of some bazookas, something like that, and a lot of plastic. Plastic was very useful to blow up everything you wanted oh, to blow up. plastic explosives. Yeah. And still you had to know, uh, it was very, very, uh, you could do every, everything you want with that and blow it. And so um, how did you coordinate amongst resistance groups? Okay, that's precisely the problem. And it's precisely, okay, so someday, right in the beginning, I learned that there was a, a, a British mission parachuted in France next to us. And I took contact with them right away. And they took a little, a little room, a little villa, a little house, just where we were. So I was in permanent, you know, contact with them. Uh -huh. And the, the English were providing English uh, planes were providing the armaments. So the, the British mission had the radio. And it's why the radio was the most important person in the world, because if you had no radio, that was over. 
you could not let London know that you were not here, that, you know, so the radio was the number one person. The radio play a role in my story, and it's why I'm mentioning the radio. So, the, why the radio? The radio could give information about the web. Several times we give information, mm -hmm. write information, or ask London for armaments and things like that, you know. And we were informed by London that that day we will have that shipping of that and that. And that. So, what, how did they ship it? Did they fly it over and drop it down in the parachute? Oh, yes, they dropped, it, they dropped the containers. You know, so you had to establish four lights because the, the planes were uh, flying too low to estimate their own altitude. And they could estimate their altitude by the, 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 the fire. We were the, putting fed fire at 100 meters of each other, and the plane knew exactly at which altitude it was and dropped the thing at that, at that altitude. So it's why once we say, oh, it's too long, it's too long, we will shorten the, that, that little distance. And we shorten the distance between the land. And I had just the time to jump before receiving on the container and the parachute on my head. Because the <laughs> well, plane... Well, you couldn't see? No, the plane, of course, the plane calculated that it was too high. So they went low, lower, and lower the, the parachute has hardly the time to open. <laughs> um, so you used the radio to say that we need We supplies. need this or we need this or we need that. So in, in the area where I was, there was my group, if you want, with the, the British mission. We were together. And then there were one, two, three, four other groups. One which was something like 1,800 men, one which was a communist one. And that is something that uh, I should also talk about. And the others, there was one with the two others about 300 or 300 and f or 400 people. So I was the one. So I became member of the British mission because Pearl told me, you are the one who are going to visit all the area, visit the Maquis. And of the, who was Pearl? Pearl was my commanding officer, a British. She was captain a British captain woman who had been parachuted with uh, a man, her, her helper, and the radio. There were three people. That was the British mission. And Pearl told me, we are going to ask London to make you a British part of the British mission because your job will be to visit all the groups around. Because she was, the British mission was more important, if you want, than a few men of the, of, uh, you know, a few, uh, if you cut the, 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 the communication with London, it, it's over. And London has no way to, to know where you are, what you do, uh, provide you with armaments and, and all that. So the British mission being the most important thing, I told Pearl, you don't go around to visit the groups or our lieutenant. I will visit all the groups and know what they want. So I became, in fact, and it's in my papers, I became, in fact, charged of all the money because you had to buy things, or, or giving a, a, a paper saying, I took this or this or that, uh, you know, the giving a receipt uh -huh. of what you were talking, which had been paid by the French government after that. If you were uh, taking, I don't know, an automobile, for example, you needed an automobile, I was giving a receipt for the automobile. I was in charge of that. So I spent my time and it's where all my adventures because we were in a country completely occupied by the Germans and I was passing my time going from one group to another one using the roads and I've been, I've been arrested uh, two or three times, you know, one time very seriously. I've been arrested because I was once more going all around. There is another thing which was, uh, which came through my mind, which was I was receiving a big box of money, of French money. <laughs> and I was, I was always wondering, oh, where, is that, money in your where is that French money coming from? <laughs> Maybe they manufacture it the, next, the, the last days, you know, to send it to me. You know, and I didn't know. I always, when I was having that big box, it was a lot of money. Because, you know, to feed it, I was, in fact, providing money for something like uh, 200 and 
more than two more than two thousand men, you know, people. Uh -huh. So that that requires a, a lot of, of money. And one of the very difficult things, because you know, it's sorry to say that, but you had a lot of French people who were pro Germans, and who were eventually some of them were eventually ready to tell to tell the Germans where the French resistance were and so on. Uh -huh. So the, 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 one of the main problem, one of my main problem was to figure out, find out who I was talking with. If it was really a friend, if I could, you know, do it, or if it was not a friend. And there are some that have been arrested because they give away some French people to the Germans. Um, what was the French... Uh, government doing at this time? Were they the French, helping you, or were no, they no, no, no. The, the Germans took them over? Or? No, the French government was basically uh, uh, basically helping the Germans. This was the goal. Oh yes, they were basi basically helping the Germans. The goal was the goal, and after the goal, you know, the goal was uh, well, after the goal, you know, there are the milices, the French milices, which are the armed people. To, to keep order, but they were for the Germans, you know. The, the, the gendarmes, the gendarmerie, you know, the gendarmes, they did ask us, they did ask me once, they did ask me one group of those people, they asked me to attack them, like that they could be made prisoner. To, to attack to, French? Yeah. To, 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 to at, no, we were supposed to attack them. They had a big building with their family. You know, they were the gendarmes. You know, they were living, uh, uh, yeah. but they were supposedly working for the for the government. They were the people of the government. So one of them came one day to to see me and say, "Hey, we are fed up with all that. We want to be with you, but we cannot leave because our wives and all that are going to make prisoners or sent out. So you attack us." And you take us. So I organized a, a, a full <laughs> attack of the Germans at midnight. F f f you know, firing, the Germans uh, or the firing French? over the roof. <laughs> the Germans or the French? The French. So you attacked the French. The French. So that people could escape. I mean, you could take them Le prisoner. Gendarme, you know, that was the gendarmerie. The gendarme, the, the French, uh, you know, police, you know. The, uh, so they, they uh, asked me to attack them. To, to come with us, but attacking them, they don't look like if they were joining us. We made them prisoner. So we attacked them at midnight with a lot of noise, with a lot of where you want, and they joined us. They did join us, and they were very useful because they were people who knew armaments and knew how to use a gun when most of our people didn't use. And we put them to teach really to and to, to train the people to use, uh, you know, uh, guts. Well, how did you feel when the French government is working with the Germans? My dear, we feel very bad, but what can you do? What can you do? I you guess know? it's survival, and you just got to uh, do yeah, it. Yeah, you, you know, uh, uh, my dear General de Gaulle, uh, sell France to, well, maybe avoided the wars, but at that at, at, at point it became that France become, you know, the helper of the Germans. So we were against all that, you know, absolutely against. So how to fight? The Germans were absolutely everywhere. There was free France were supposed to be free France, but uh, uh, six months after free France, the Germans were absolutely, absolutely everywhere. And you also probably had to look out for French officials. If they were working with the Germans, you, how do you know who's who? Well, that was precisely, that was the, the big, big, big difficulty. But when I was in the Marquis, we ignored the French. We ignored. Did you uh, have what? secret handshakes so you, or code words that you could... No, no, I ignored them completely. Completely. We, you, it's too difficult to, to know if the employee of the government at that time were really against or pro the Germans. It was impossible, and we didn't need them, in fact. If we, did that, we were in the woods, so we didn't need them. Well, it's probably best to be kind of anar anarchistic because Germans can't figure out what it is you're going to, what your next move is, because you guys don't know, the, guy, the people next door don't know, and... Uh, 
You know, it's to attack the strategy. German, to attack the German was very simple. Eh? It was very very simple. You had the railroads. You took attack the railroads, but the railroads, you know, with the plastic, the railroads, you had to pay attention because many times they had the flat wagon in front of the locomotive with uh, 30 uh, French uh, people to eventually work on the bridge or work on what was what destroyed. So you have to pay attention not to kill them. So the, that was not, the breaking the, 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 the line was not very efficient. We gave, up, we gave that up. The only thing that succeeded is that I have organized some kind of a, a secret telephone from, from other countries, you know, to me. And we learned that a train of ammunition was traveling and was going to pass by where we were. And all of a sudden, we said that to London, and London sent one plane, not two planes, that, that started to blow up the, the train. And the train makes three days to blow up completely. So for three days, the traffic was completely stopped. That was one of our great successes. Wouldn't it have been um, just to stop the train and get the armaments? How can you do that? I don't know. You had the Germans everywhere, my dear. It was absolutely impossible. Plus, it was what kind of armaments? We didn't even know what it was. And we could use it. And beside that, it was the Germans. Hey, that was defended by the Germans. So we could not attack that. And so how did you keep morale up? In your group, besides from feeding people good, how do, how, did, how do you keep morale up so people want to keep going and don't give up? Oh, we gave up, we gave up a lot of work to do. Okay, so the, the main, main, what became the main, main job was that some of the roads, the Germans were obliged to pass by their, those roads. So we were attacking the Germans on the roads with a very specific techniques to do that. You dispose of a line of guy ready to, to shoot at the Germans and to retreat absolutely. No fight with the Germans. We were not in, in, in no way able to fight, fight, fight the Germans, have a real right. fight with the Germans. So you surprise the Germans by fighting at them and you disappear. Hit and run. Exactly. That was, that was the, the, the main tactic. And I think if folks that are younger that are listening to this, there weren't a lot of roads back then. There were just, what, a handful of roads? It's yeah, not exa- like today exactly. where they there's were, roads. They were obliged to, pl- to pass by the same roads. And it's, it's how I was some kind of a, of a, a... I don't know what to say. I was the guy everywhere and nowhere. And I saw, for example, and I count them, 50 cyclists. Bicycle soldiers with bicycles, 50 of them. German? G- German. Going up, uh, the, ro- the road was up, you know, and they were walking, pushing their bicycle. And not one bicycle had tires. They were all with, you know, a little uh, a thing, a little, uh, how do you call that, uh, linen around the tire, you know, with, with oh. ropes and all that. They had no tires. I saw uh, a beautiful, uh, Renault, Grand Sport Renault, you know, the big, the big car, uh, elegant, very, with four German officers living, living, you know, they, they had to go back to Germany. They had no tires. The, the car they, was making with no tires. <laughs> is that when you started feeling like, oh, we have a chance to win? <laughs> yeah, but at the same time, you also have some groups which were very, very, very mean. You have to pay attention. They have been made prisoner with the new commanding of the French uh, sent by de Gaulle. De Gaulle sent some days and a captain to be supposedly the big director of the whole thing. And I was captured on the 15th of, of uh, August in, in Valence by uh, the SS Das Reich. And the SS Das Reich is the Das Reich that burned one week before, they killed Oradour sur Glane. You heard of Oradour sur Glane, that little village that has been completely destroyed with all the inhabitants killed by that SS by Das Reich. And they make me prisoner one week later. With, I was transporting the new commanding officer, French commanding officer. So you were taken prisoner? Yeah, I was taken prisoner. 
How did I you was I, I was with my car, of course, a Citroën, you know, a Citroën. And the Citroën, because the German had Citroën. So if you were meeting, like I did, a convoy of, of trucks, for example, German trucks, and you were in your Citroën, they did know who you were. They could suppose that you were the Gestapo or you were something like that. And you make a... A this Citroën sign. is an expensive the, the, car? No, it, no, it's the, 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 you know, first wheel. You know, you saw it everywhere on movies. The, the little Citroën, the flat oh, it's car, a yeah. Motorcycle or no, no, no. It's a flat car with the. It's the first car with uh, power on the first wheel on the oh, all right. wheel. front wheel drive. Yeah, so that was the big German. The German in France they use only that, and the Gestapo, the French Gestapo, use only that, and I was using that. So if I was crossing, uh, it did happen to me twice to cross a, a convoy of German trucks. I made hello, hello, so they didn't know if I was not a guy of the Gestapo, uh, the Gestapo in, the, in, the, in the little car like that. So the, I escaped for that. So what were you asking me? Oh, you were taken prisoner. How did you get out of... Um... Oh, yes. So, so, so he said, put the car against the wall. So I put the car against the wall and my commanding, my commanding officer was resting in the car. He didn't want to go out. He was, he was not, I believe... Uh, you know, I will tell you something. He was drunk. No, he, no, no. He was, he was, he was just fearing for his life, I believe. Oh. So I leave him over there in, in the car, and after a war, you don't know you have reflexes like that. I get mad, and I had asked the Chateau de Valencay, the the owner, to give me his his uh, pass with his car. So I had the pass, the, the car was not the same car, but they, the German didn't pay attention to the, to the car, to the, you know, uh, identification of the car. So I get mad, I get mad. Uh, so I went to see, there was a big German officer in the middle of the road, you know, giving orders, he was the commanding officer of the old Das Reich, you know. So I went to see him and I put, and that pass was signed by Stupnagel. General Stupnagel, and General Stupnagel was the general commanding all the forces, all the German forces in France. So hey, it was a big name, eh? so I say I, I risk absolutely nothing at all. Eh? I'm going to put them under his nose, eh? and he, he can do nothing at all. So I put them under his nose, and he look at me, and he say, "Sir, in good French, he told me that in good French." You ignore one thing. General Schupnagel has been by Hitler yesterday. He is not anymore commanding the army in France. So your pass or nothing is the same. And he took the pass and oh. and and torn it and he said, Go out. And it's how I escaped my dear. <laughs> so when Hitler let go of General Stupnagel? Yeah. Did, was that a sign that you guys were winning? Uh, uh, we didn't know it. I, I learned it, and you know, the most efficient thing is that, as I, he told me that in French, and the old Das Reich was speaking French. So you were like one of the first people to know that the commander, of, the German commanding officer in France was, was like, French. Was fri fired. He was speaking French, and the whole division was speaking French. And you know why? They were all Alsatian. And in Alsace, you had the pro French and the pro German. And they were the Alsace pro German. And the whole division was speaking French. And he addressed myself with a little smile, he addressed myself in French. Saying you don't know it, but I can understand you. But he didn't. He didn't verify the number of the car. Nothing at and all. He didn't even go over to the commanding officer and say, "Get out of the car." No. No, 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 no. I get mad. I just get mad. You know, sometimes you have a reflex like that. I, after two or three hours in the car, I, I, I'm fed up to see that guy commanding. They burn this house. They take that wine here, they take that radio here, they were piaging everything, you know, and the whole division, the, all the, 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 the car, the trucks, the, the tanks, everything was here in the street, eh? so they were all, all the Germans were going into all houses and picking up all they, they can pick up, 
So during that time, uh, I was over there, and uh, that officer was in the middle of the room. He was not moving. Nice man, a uh, very nice guy. Uh, so after two or three hours, I don't remember how long, I got fed up. Fed up. You know, you have reflexes like that. I said, what yeah. was the risk? Or at the point where we are, where is the risk? So I go <laughs> like that with my pass. <laughs> and what town was this? That was in Valence. And on the 15th of August. How, of what year? That was uh, 40, 48. So it's one year before the end of the war. No, the, 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 yeah, the, the liberation of Paris was in 48. Oh, okay. And we fought after the liberation of Paris. Oh, I'm sure Because you did. The, the liberation of Paris was on one side, and we were under that, and the Germans were still passing by to, to go to, to, to Vierzon and put their tank on, 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 on trains. You know, and once we did one, <laughs> I can tell that, we did one very interesting stop of Germans. 15,000 Germans stopped in the middle of nowhere. They didn't want to stop in the forest because they were always afraid to be attacked. But they were, they were stopped because they had no more gas. So you had all the trucks, very clean trucks with, I don't know, 20 soldiers on uh, in every trucks and the gun at the, you know, at the end of the trucks, a gun pulled by the truck. So there was a whole division, 15,000 men, no more gas. They could don't know where. So they asked us to surrender, but they wanted an officer to surrender. So I gave the, the number one, my uh, Pearl, I just went to Pearl and said, hey, they are over there. And they had no gas. And one of my groups, I picked up, I picked up two, car, two, two, two trucks of gas, you know, with the swastika, a big painted on the side, you know, at a, at a, on a ground which was a, a, a airfield ground, mm -hmm. not too far away. And they had been successful at picking up two trucks, two absolutely full of gas. The Germans or the French? The French. So I had, I had those two trucks, and when those 15 girls could not go anymore any further with that, I, I give them the gas with their own trucks, with the swastika, on the, so, so, you know. So I pull out in every, you know, every uh, truck at the, at the gas, except I forget to tell them only one thing, that was plain gas. Oh, and kerosene. gas, you have to put oil in the gas if you want to go very far. <laughs> I didn't tell them. <laughs> I put the gas like that. <laughs> I did that with a chainsaw one time, so. <laughs> the the uh, engine and the chainsaw did not last very long. No, they just, I believe, they just have to go to the frontier of the, the to France where the, the Americans, I believe they were able to go to the Americans. I never heard of them anymore. So they have just been able to go to the Americans, but I should say no more, huh? because the, the gas with no oil in it, the engine could not make it. Well, Michelle, we're getting close to the end of um, our time today. Um, I have not and we got a lot more stories to go, don't oh, we? Oh, absolutely, my dear, because um, I didn't tell you the, the, the most uh, important story of all that. All right, well, let's, people, you're going to have to tune in next week if you want to <laughs> hear that story. but. People can can read this um, account of yeah, World War II. Yeah, I did. I did not. One of my friends published a, a book called René's War, and you can find it at Amazon. René's War, and it, this is like your autobiography. This, yeah, my, my personal war, if you want. The, my story of what I went through, through that war, because it's not a war in the trenches or whatever, you know, one of those wars like... Uh, uh, some war, regular war, or big artillery, or what? No, that's something else. That's once more, and we did what we can, and I will tell you uh, next time. I will tell you what we did. Really, we we were successful in few things. If <laughs> folks want to get in touch with you, how can they do that? Well, uh, my uh, the name is uh, Michel Mockers, in one word, at gmail.com. And you have a website where people can read. Uh, the positive dialectic, it's along with other things. It's that, uh, no dash pennies. dot com. And we, we have no money. And you're so working. No pennies. 
<laughs> you're working on a um, uh, a book of cartoons too, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. It's coming out soon. Yeah, yeah. It's All coming right. soon. And we're gonna be talking about that in the near future too. Yeah, because I will give you one before we t we can talk. I'm <laughs> going to print them. Okay, Michelle, it's been a pleasure. No, George, I, I, I am very happy to tell, maybe it looks like stories like that, but very happy to tell Americans that we did, in fact, we try to help as much as we could to help the, you know, it was the D-Day, you were in Normandy, the American uh, allied were in Normandy, and we try our best to bother the Germans and to help the, the, the you know, all the people who are here to, to liberate us. So we try our best to help to that liberation. It sounds like you did a lot. I want to thank everybody for listening today and uh, please join us again next week um, for another edition of Radio Free Will. Thanks, Michelle. George, it was my pleasure.